Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things. Today I'm going to be going through all my favourite books of 2015. And so I started off with 10 and then the list expanded. So I'm going to be doing my top 15 of 2015 plus one extra bonus one. I read a lot of books this year. I read 131 books, which is quite a lot. So it was quite hard to narrow it down. But these books that I'm about to talk about were the books that most stood out for me are ones that I just most thoroughly enjoyed as well as the ones I thought were like the most beautifully written or the most like superbly crafted. I'm just going to be talking about stuff that I've read for the first time this year. I'm not going to be mentioning any rereads because I reread a lot of Jane Austen this year and obviously Jane Austen always ranks very high for me and I feel it wouldn't be fair for me to include all of the books of hers that I've reread this year. Although there will still be a Jane Austen because there was one thing by Jane Austen that I read for the first time this year. But anyway, so before I get into my actual top 15, I just have an honourable mention, which is Dickens at Christmas. The reason why I'm not including this in my top rankings is because I said I wasn't going to include any rereads, and this was like half a reread and half not, because I'd read like half of the content in this before and the other half I hadn't. But I still felt like I wanted to quickly mention this because I thought it was such a beautifully put together book and it was lovely to have all of Dickens's like Christmas related writing in one place. And also two of the novellas that are included in this, The Cricket on the Hearth and The Haunted Man, I hadn't read before and they were definitely two of my favourite things this year. I thought they were brilliant. It was really nice to read some of his less well known Christmas stories and I thought this was beautiful. So this is my honourable mention. Now on to the 15. At number 15 we have A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Zecchi. I really loved this. I thought it was so beautifully and poignantly written, so cleverly written. I really enjoy books that have like a split narrative between two halves. It's told half from the perspective of a young girl now living in Japan, although she spent most of her life in America, and now is writing about kind of the, her experiences of her family moving from America to Japan, and also about her great grandmother, who is a Buddhist nun, which is pretty cool. And then the other half of the book is a woman called Ruth, who finds Nao's diary like washed up on a beach, and it's about her reading it. The reason why it's not higher up in this list was because I found certain bits of it a bit overdone, especially the magic realism. I like magic realism in short stories and I sometimes like it in books, but I like it when it's not stated. Like, I think the problem I have with the magic realism in this is that it wasn't like completely fully formed, but they tried to explain it and I didn't feel like it needed to be explained and that kind of bugged me a little bit. I also was much more engaged by now story than Ruth. Again, I really, really love this. Like I said, it was one of my favourite books of the year, but I just wanted to briefly explain why it's not higher up on the list. Um, but yeah, I still loved it. Anyway. Next, at number 13 and 14, I have two YA books. Both are like the third in a series, and I feel like they kind of draw. One is Clockwork Princess by Cassandra Clare, which is the third one in the Infernal Devices series, and the other is Ptolemy's Gate by Jonathan Stroud. Both of these were the finale to trilogies that I'd really enjoyed, and I thought both of them like wrapped up the series really well and in terms of like pure enjoyment both of them were like quite high up for me on this year. Next The Emery's by Richard O'Brien. I mentioned this in my wrap up yesterday. This is the only poetry thing in this list. I thought this was beautiful. It's a small pamphlet of love poems by Richard O'Brien published by Emma Press who are a beautiful small independent press that just publish the most pretty books with lovely illustrations and they're just gorgeous. I just thought these poems were absolutely beautiful and a real pleasure and joy to read. At number 11 The Rental Heart and Other Fairy Tales. This is a collection of short stories slash fairy tales by Kirsty Logan. I thought this was absolutely beautiful, really weird. There's a lot of magic realism and kind of strangeness in here. It reminded me a bit of Angela Carter. This is like a modern, different, and yeah, I think maybe better version of The Bloody Chamber. I love this. I thought it was beautiful and moving and unsettling in all the right places. At number 10 is How To Be Both by Ali Smith, which I thoroughly loved. This book, in case you don't know, is told in two halves. One half is about a girl called George in modern times, and the other half is about a Renaissance painter. Depending on what copy of the book you put up, sometimes it's George's half first and sometimes it's the Renaissance half first. I had the modern half first and then the Renaissance one and overall I think I preferred the modern half but I still really loved both. It's a really beautiful exploration of how to be both male and female, how to be both like past and present, how to be both like one thing and another. It's just a really interesting way of deconstructing binaries and I thought it was absolutely beautiful. I found it so moving and lovely and the writing is really interesting. In ninth place, Grief is the Thing with Feathers by Max Porter. I thought this book was absolutely beautiful and I also met the author at work and he was really nice so that's just an added bonus. I said that The Emoirs was the only poetry thing I was mentioning here but this is kind of between prose and poetry in a way. I would say it is a novel or a novella but it has a lot of like poetic influences. It is about 
a man and his two sons recovering from the death of the man's wife, of the children's mother. While they are getting over their grief or kind of coming to terms with it, they get visited by a crow, who is the crow from Ted Hughes's Crow Poems, and he kind of helps them through their grief. And it's so weird, but it's so brilliant. At number eight, The Lick by Banana Yoshimoto. As you know, this has kind of been the year of Banana Yoshimoto for me. I read one of her books back in February, but I'll be talking about that one later, and after that, bought like everything that she'd had translated into English second hand. I've only got one of her books left to read now so I've read a lot of Banani Oshimoto this year and I just think her writing is superb. I just found this so moving. It's about a young woman and her next door neighbour and kind of their relationship and it's also about dealing with trauma long after it has happened and coming to terms with grief and just just so many beautiful things. Also the central character paints murals, she does wall paintings and I thought that was just a really cool nice interesting detail. Just overall I just thoroughly love this. Seventh, The Child is by Anna Smale. It is a dystopian novel set in the future in a world that is ruled by music and because the world that they live in is ruled by music the central character and the way he describes things, the way he narrates, it's in first person, uses lots of musical terminology and language which as like I, I'm not really musical but I, I play the piano and I used to play the trumpet and the euphonium and I just thought this was so beautiful. Like the way Anna Smale deals with language in this book is so beautiful. I thought it was so just lovingly written and just such a brilliant world and I really liked the character of Simon and also of Lucian and I really enjoyed their relationship and the way that developed across the whole of the book. I found the plot pacing really good. I just loved it. In sixth place, A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan. I thoroughly thoroughly love this book. It is a series of interconnected short stories which are linked together by various characters that appear kind of in other people's stories and by like the thread of music and the music industry. So the first story is about a woman called Sasha and the next story is about her boss Benny and the next story after that is about a childhood friend of Benny's and the next story after that is about the ex-boyfriend of a friend of that childhood friend of Benny's and it just kind of carries on like that in a really awesome way. I love how the stories are kind of interlinked and all really different. They're all told with such different narrative styles. There is a story in the second person, there are stories in like first person present tense really immediate really in the language of the characters. There is a story told in through a powerpoint presentation. There are stories from the perspective of a really objective omniscient narrator and I just love the kind of variation within this book and the way they all tie together. I think as well this book has a special place in my heart because as you may or may not know, I was doing an MA in creative writing last year and I was writing a series of interconnected short stories and this was the first one I had read that I thought really worked and I was like, aha, it can be done, it can be done. Not that I think that in my life I'm ever going to be as good a writer as Jennifer Egan, but it was just nice to know that it can be done. That was enjoyable. I thought this was such a beautiful book. It made me so happy. Anyway, more on Jennifer Egan later. In fifth place, Lady Susan by Jane Austen. I said there would be some Jane Austen in here. Although I had read all of Jane Austen's longer novels, I had never actually read her novella Lady Susan until this year and I was very very excited. I hadn't even known it had existed until I started working at the Jane Austen Centre and then I read it and I thoroughly loved it. I mean I've spoken about it a lot. I'll link my Jane Austen week video on Lady Susan below where I talk about it in much more detail but I find it absolutely hilarious. I love the savage humour of it. I love how different it is to Jane Austen's other works. It's about a widow in her late 30s who already has a 16 year old daughter who is very scheming, very evil, a bit kind of Caroline Bingley meets Isabella Thorpe character but older and she's just brilliant and I thought it was a brilliant, brilliant novella and I had to include some Jane Austen in here somewhere because really considering I worked at the Jane Austen Centre for quite a lot of 2015, 2015 really was a year of Jane Austen for me and it was great. Anyway, moving on. So now I'm getting on to the top four, and these final four I feel like they could not quite be in any order, but they're all really high up, but they are all the best books of the year for me. They are all incredible. In fourth place is Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. I cannot fault this novel. This novel was superb. It is my favourite dystopian thing I've ever read. It is one of my favourite books I've ever read. It is a dystopian novel about an epidemic that wipes out about 99% of the human population. And the book is set partly before the epidemic and partly 20 years after and it is partly about a travelling group of actors who perform Shakespeare in the face of the end of the world. And although that isn't as big a part of the novel as a lot of people wanted it to be, I actually didn't find that a problem. What I think I really loved about this book was how many plot lines there were and how many characters there were and yet I never felt confused and I never felt like any of the characters were underdeveloped and I never felt like I didn't know what was going on and although it's short and there are a lot of characters I felt like I knew everyone and I just 
thought it was so perfectly done and I loved the hope in it. Like, it's not often that you read a dystopian novel that has this much, like, hope in humanity and I thought it was beautiful. That's how I want all my dystopians to be. Yes, things have gone wrong, but people are still performing Shakespeare. In third place, Mary Barton by Elizabeth Gaskell. Oh, Elizabeth Gaskell, I need to read some more by her. North and South by her is one of my favourite books of all time, and I'm also really fond of Wives and Daughters and Cranford and some of her shorter works that I've read. But this year I read Mary Barton for the first time and I just was blown away by it. Mary Barton focuses on several working class families in industrial Manchester in the 19th century. There is a young woman, Mary Barton, who has two men who are interested in her. One is like her childhood friend, Jem, and one is a richer, wealthier gentleman. And I should stress, there is a bit of a love triangle, but this book is so much more than that. I can't really explain what this book is about without spoiling it, but it is one of the most incredible books I've ever read, and it is really interesting, really unexpected, really moving and powerful and just brilliant. And I think Mary Barton is a wonderful character, a really interesting 19th century heroine, and it just, ah, oh, what a book. In second place is Emerald City by Jennifer Egan. We had a visit from the Goon Squad by her earlier, and now Emerald City. This is a collection of short stories, and it is, I'm pretty sure, my favourite collection of short stories ever written. And I'm so excited to have a collection of short stories that's taken place in my favourite books of the year, because I have read quite a lot of short stories this year, more than I had before, and it was really lovely to read more because I love them so much. And this is beautiful. I loved A Visit from the Goon Squad because her writing was brilliant and the idea was brilliant and I loved how they all linked together, but in this her writing was beautiful again and every story was perfect. Like, I think I nearly cried at every story, every story was incredible, it moved me so much. And I loved how like various the stories were and there were kind of all sorts of relationships were dealt with, you know, parents and siblings and friends and lovers and such a wide variety of people and kind of all over the world, from China to New York. My favourites were Sacred Heart and One Piece, but they were just all so beautiful. I really need to reread this. I think I'm going to reread it this year because it was just so, so intensely beautiful and obviously it's quite short and I just, I recommend this so strongly. If you like short stories, even if you don't, please, please read this. These are the best short stories I have read. Every story is perfect. I just, oh my goodness, so amazing. And finally, my favourite book of 2015 had to be Kitchen by Banani Oshimoto. This has two, like, novellas or two short stories in. One is Kitchen and one is Moonlight Shadow. Moonlight Shadow is probably not my favourite thing of the year, even though I loved it, but Kitchen is, and this book overall is, partly just because it started me on this massive Banani Oshimoto thing that has happened this year where I read nearly everything she'd written in a year, which is quite good for me because normally I read one book of an author and I love it and then I forget about them for ages, but Banani Oshimoto was so good that I couldn't because her writing is just incredible and Kitchen is one of the most moving things I've ever read. It's about grief and it is about loneliness and it's about gender and it is about like solitude and friendship and it is just so beautiful and it's also about the love of food and that sounds like a really small thing but I love the way food acts in both of these stories and the way that people kind of bond over it and it was just beautiful. I just, her writing is superb and beautiful and I'm getting very excited now so I'm gonna have to stop. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed my favourite books of 2015. I feel like I got a bit too excited. Sorry about that. I feel like it's also gone on quite a long time. Also sorry about that. But please let me know if you have read any of these books and if you liked them. And please let me know what your favourite book of the year was. I really want to know and maybe I'll try and read some of them next year. I can't guarantee I have a very long TBR. I'll be talking about that tomorrow. But you never know, I might. I'll be back tomorrow when I'll be talking about my reading resolutions for 2016. In the meantime, happy reading and goodbye.